United's class was so practical, so relevant, so amazing, so transformative. You just have to watch it. And I think, and I hope you will absolutely agree with every superlative I just said. So last week, we began a topic that, of course, was related to the Torah portion, the Parsha of last week, Vayesha. And in the Torah portion, in the Parsha, at the end, the entire last Aliyah, the seventh, and also most of the six, is listing a lot of evil, evil, evil people. And when you read it, and then when you learn some Rashi, like horrifically evil, perverted, twisted, corrupt, immoral people, and so many of them. And then we're told, what happened? Well, a spark from Yaakov called Yosef comes and consumes them all. Which means these people make a lot of noise. They take up a lot of space. They seem really big and really powerful and poof, they're gone. And that was really the theme that we discussed last week. The theme was evil doesn't have power unless you give it power. Don't empower evil. And we said this applies in the world. And of course, we know on the global scale, there are definitely things that people today fear, which seems like a very normal reaction to some of these things going on. But we said it might be normal, but it's not the best. The best is deflate it by not giving it attention at all. Yeah, if you have to deal, deal, but deal without fear. Fear means you're giving a power and we don't give evil power. So we spoke about it on the cosmic level for actually quite a while last week. And then we spoke about it, of course, what's most relevant to us is on the personal level. Like, you know, the joke that says that, oh, the husband and wife split responsibilities. The husband takes care of all the important things like who's going to be the president of America? How are we going to solve the gas crisis? And the woman just does the minor details, like where the kids are going to school and the finances and all the minor stuff of their own home. So that's obviously what's really relevant in our lives. And also here on the personal level, we said the same thing. When we see something wrong, evil, negative, bad, we don't want to fear it. We don't want to believe in it. And as we don't believe in it, we destroy it. And we really liked it. A lot of work last week on this concept. I showed you a pattern. I gave a lot of examples of the pattern. We practiced the pattern. I gave you sample questions that you succeeded in. And then you did your own. And the basic pattern was, one, identify this thing as, as evil. And two, remind yourself that evil has no power unless you empower it. And then ignore it, which again, ignore it could have different applications depending on what the issue is. And that was basically the pattern again and again. Identify this as evil. Remind yourself that evil has no power unless you empower it. Consciously resolve not to empower it, not making it four steps, and then ignore it. And it applied to yourself. It applied to your little children. It applied to your big children. It applied to your spouse. It's all the same pattern. Identify this as evil. Remind yourself evil has no power. Consciously choose and resolve not to empower it and ignore it. Um, before we go on, because I really wanted to do another level in this concept, did anyone use this over the week? Did anything come up over the week that reminded them of this concept? I remember something else you said, which is maybe similar, but um, a couple of weeks ago, you said to just trust Hashem and you said, trust Hashem and don't worry. And so I've been doing that a lot. Good. And I sometimes so appreciate it works and hearing sometimes that. it doesn't. <laughs> I so appreciate hearing that. I, I I I so appreciate it because Thank you. so many times, you know, you don't know. We, we want everything to carry through to your life. That's why we're doing mm -hmm. this. And I'm so happy because there's nothing yeah. more powerful than trust. Yep. Uh, oh. I wrote it down and I keep repeating it. Trust Hashem, don't stress. So it's become my mantra now. Good. That's, that's amazing. And there's so Thank many you. people I have seen personally, I just saw like an amazing miracle that someone experienced last week, last Monday, and it was literally her trust created it. It was impossible to happen. It was impossible to happen. It was impossible to happen. I kept telling her, don't worry. God's not limited by possible. It happened. Thank you. That's beautiful. And Thank Hanukkah's you. coming up. That's a good time for all these things yep. to get resolved. So let's take this idea 
of evil having no power unless you empower it. And let, let's go a little deeper because in truth, not that everything we said last week wasn't true, but in truth, going deeper into this concept, what we were saying last week was we're looking at a situation and we're trying to diffuse the situation by removing our belief in it, by removing our belief in the power of that negative, bad, evil word for, you know, whatever you're talking about there. But going deeper, it's not only that I believe in it and fear it and worry over it and that empowers it. Actually, my belief in this thing is actually a piece of why it's there in the first place. Meaning, even when we're talking about with someone else, not your own issues, your own problems, even someone else, my gosh, my child has a this, my husband has a that, my mother, my mother-in-law, my boss, my colleague. I mean, you're saying I'm creating all this stuff and everyone else. If it's someone else, obviously you're only a piece, but everything is the hand of God. Everything is divine providence, hashgacha pratis. So the fact that this negativity is interfacing with you means you need to take ownership of your belief in it. Right now, you're trying to suppress your belief, but that belief is actually a part of why it exists and why you're affected by it. Now, I know that might sound a bit uh, extreme or like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to take ownership for all these problems. I don't want to be part of the problems. No, no, no. I came to the wrong class. But no, you came to the right class because we're going to talk about changing it. So don't worry. This is, this is about changing and getting out of this space. So let me give a simple example. Let's start with, your, with yourself. I mean, this isn't you, but I'm just making up an example that a person that's easier for us to understand, because obviously it's easier for us to take ownership of ourselves than to take ownership of other people. So let's say, say a, a normal woman, you know, not, no, you know, unusual issues in her life. And every week she loses it. She raises her voice. She screams at her husband. She screams at her kids. What we spoke about last week was stop feeding this. Stop empowering this power that's so destructive. What we're saying now is your belief in it is why it happens in the first place. Meaning, in this example I'm giving, this mother, spouse, that's always, it could it be a man, I'm talking to women, I'm a woman, so I'm thinking of a woman. The vision of self of this person, we'll say of ourselves, if we're going to say this is us, is that I don't have self-control. That's my vision. I don't have self-control. Obviously, a person with self-control doesn't lose it. It doesn't scream. It doesn't raise her voice. And no one here is going to philosophically say that, yes, screaming and raising voice, voice is a wonderful technique in child rearing. And it's a great tool in spouse relationships and harmony in the home. So none of us believe in that as a technique. So therefore, why is it happening? Well, the person tells themselves, we tell ourselves, I, I don't have self-control. I lose it. That's an evil. Now, it's an evil that the person is feeding because they know it's true. This is me. I I've been this way for years, years and years and years and years. I have countless examples that this is true. I'm not believing in this. This is reality. You know, believing in it is something that's not real, but this is real. This is me. That's what the person tells themselves. But actually, that's not true. Actually, that is not true. You are believing in this. And your belief keeps feeding this manifestation or in this situation, the many manifestations. So how do you stop this cycle? To stop the cycle, a person needs to identify this point of truth. My belief is feeding this. It's really, a, it sounds very simple and it's such a great quick fix solution. No, it's not quick fix. It's not a quick fix solution. And it's not simple to say that because it really means I'm taking ownership of this problem. I don't want to take ownership. I just want to feel I'm suffering. But no, we're saying your belief is feeding this. Take ownership. And then, of course, don't stop there. That's not going to help. You'll just feel worse. Uproot the belief. How do you uproot a belief, especially a belief which you might have held for the past 40 years about yourself or more? 
You uproot the belief by having something else prepared in your pocket because you thought about this in advance. This is not something you're doing spontaneously. You have something else prepared that every time that thing, that evil thought, that negative, self-destructive, destroying you and destroying your relationship with your kids and destroying the harmony in your home, that's an evil thing. Every time it crosses your mind, in this example, you have this thought raising, I'm making it very tailored to this very specific example. Obviously, it's just an example. Raising my voice is wrong. And I don't do that however upset I am. That person can make another thought. I'm just giving you an example of how we have that prepared because you know you do this. You've been doing it for 40 years. You know yourself. But now you're taking ownership and you're saying, I have a choice. I, I, I didn't think I created this. I thought I'm the victim of it. But if we're saying, no, let's switch it in our brains. Let's switch it that you're actually creating this. And you're taking ownership that you're creating it. Well, now, this is how we change. And you keep giving yourself that message again and again and again and again. Every time that thing comes up, you keep clinging to the message because it's very hard to change. But this is your lifeline. Basically, the prior message was, I scream, I lose it. And now the message is, I don't do that. I don't do that. However stressed I am, I don't do that. However tired, exhausted, drained, depleted I am, I don't do that. I have self-control. I don't do that. So how long is this going to take? How long is it going to take to change? Honestly, it depends how deep-rooted that negative belief is. It's your whole life you viewed yourself as, I don't have self-control. It could take a while. If this is something that's going on for a year, I'd say three months of solid work and you're past it. But it's worth it. Even if it takes a while, imagine, again, in this very specific little example, imagine a home where there's no screaming, where there's no fighting, where there's no raising of voices, where there's no disrespect between people. That's worth the work. And, and we have that power. This is what we can do. Now, I think it's easier, and that's obviously why I started with the example of self. It's easier for us to really accept that, at least philosophically, that we do create this negativity, the, the evil that clings to us. We create it. We postulated it. We made it up. We feed it. We keep reinforcing it. Okay, we, we, we can take ownership. But it also applies, obviously in a limited way, but it also applies to all the other people in your world. Now the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, and this to me is the greatest tip for all those that are working on not gossiping. It's the only one that I can really think that I know really affects me. Lubavitcher Rebbe says that when you say or even think negatively about another person, it actually is strengthening their negativity. Now, obviously there are other factors, but this is a core truth, which means translated, my belief in someone's weakness feeds their weakness. And conversely, my belief in someone's strength feeds their strength. So we're not taking complete ownership for other people's issues. But why am I dealing with this? Why does this affect me? Why is this impinging on my life? Why is this hurting my goals and my life and my vision? I want to take responsibility for my peace. And I trust that if I deal with my peace, maybe the situation won't be resolved, but it won't be impinging on my world. Because in my world, it doesn't exist. It might still exist in other areas, but by me, it's not going to exist. And I'd like you to tell me what message to use to replace the negative belief that this person is feeding themselves? So again, we're going to start with self because then for sure we can stand up and take full responsibility. So it's Erev Shabbos every single Friday. It's Erev Shabbos. And every single Friday, you, the person we're talking about, feels tense and stressed. There is no way to do everything that needs to be done by 359. And 
I think now it's getting a little later. So every week, the same thing happens. You feel bad. You light the candles very late. You're upset at your husband and kids for not helping enough. And you're upset at yourself for not being put together. And the next week, the same thing happens. Not such a crazy example that never happens in anyone's life. Maybe for some of us, it's never happened. And maybe some of us are more familiar with this. But it's a common enough example. It's a normal range example. That's why I wanted to use something very normal range. So let's start by asking. So I'd like to give you an example. What do you think is a negative message this person is feeding herself? I can't get my act together. I can't manage my time. I can't, uh, I can't get everything ready on time. I'm not organized. I should know better. I should have started yesterday. Right? All, everything you else said, you else said six things and every one of them resonated because a person that does this said all of those things to herself, everything I'm not put together. I can't get my act together. I, every week I tell myself I should have started on Thursday. If I start on Thursday, I should have started on Wednesday. I'm so disorganized. I, I'm so dysfunctional. Aliza, what were you going to add? So after last era of Shabbos, I had this conversation. I'm so sorry. Where, I, I wasn't spying on your home, but okay. No, no, no. No, I want you to know, I, Nachas, I, I'm, I'm about to brag. I, not brag in a bad way, but in a good, like, normal way. So after last air of Shabbos, where I looked at the clock and thought, I'm missing. I wanted to bring in Shabbos so early because I need all of the time to be able to. I want to be ready and waiting for the Shabbos queen and not just ready and waiting, but I'm, I'm now I don't have the time that I wanted for all the tachin, all these tefillos. And, and here, and then I said, wait a minute. Let's see Tahara. Okay. It's time to bench lift and Motsi Shabbos, I'll come up with my plan. And right now, Yitzhahara, I have no more time for you. I've given you too much time on every air of Shabbos, especially when I'm running late. So nope, no more time. So that's what I did. Perfect. And okay, so Motsi Shabbos, I sat down with myself by my Malava Malka candles with my Tehillim that I say Motsi Shabbos. I have made different routines and said, okay, if I had an extra day, then what would I do? What could I do? So I want you to know, I went backwards. And right now, my challah dough is rising for its second time. And instead of making it on Thursday, I decided that Shabbos is just coming in too early. I'm going to be ready by tomorrow night. And my challah dough is rising for its second time. And it looks great. Bli Ein Hara. And I'm not planning on having a conversation with me to Hara because when it tries to converse with me. I'm basically going to say, nope, I learned from Chava not to talk to you. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> I learned from Chava not to talk to you. I like that one. Thank you. Perfect. So this is the success story. We're going to go back to the failure story. Well, I don't know. I can only tell you next week. On. I can only tell you next week. If no, it's no, your howl is already rising. It's a success story. <laughs> and I, love, I, I love the basic point of what Elisa said that relates to our concept is I don't want anyone to get intimidated and think they have to make their call on Wednesday. Um, I do do everything on Friday. And last week I had non-religious guests that wanted to experience the whole Shabbat, beautiful. And they were coming at 345, which means at 345, of course, all the food is ready and the house is spotless. And I'm already dressed in my Shabbos robe. And it all happened. If you're going to make it happen, it's going to happen. But I, what I liked what Belize's point was, this is our point, identifying it as evil and saying, I'm not going there. I'm not wasting my time and my energy going there. I'm just going to strategically plan, in Elisa's case, not in mine, to make her challah Wednesday. I'm strategically planning to make my challah on Friday, everything be ready also. And my daughter said, Ma, you should do this every week. I'm like, oh my God, don't tell me that. But it worked. Anyway, but I agree with all of your messages. Because of course we know those messages. Now, maybe we don't have this issue with Shabbos at all. Maybe we cook our whole Shabbos on Thursday. Maybe we uh, get someone to make our whole Shabbos and someone to clean as well and bathe the children. We don't have this issue. But we know in different window dressing the message. And bottom line, I'm not put together. I'm disorganized. Everyone else but me. I'm not functioning. I'm losing it. I'm not planning. Yes. So why am I calling this evil? 
looking at this very specific example, we'll take this very specific example. It's just organization is evil. Why are we saying, I'm saying, this woman, typical woman, da da da, we know the script, we understand the script, we might have lived the script, we might have viewed other people going through the script. And she keeps telling herself, I'm saying, we're just saying one of the six things the L said, they were all absolutely true. I'm disorganized. I can't handle it. I can't, I'm not put together. Why is that evil? What would be the evil in this situation? Why would the Eight of Her be wasting its time, so to speak, to take this message, this erroneous belief, and make it full force? What's the evil going on here? Why, what's, why is it evil for a woman to, to feel she's just organized and not put together. And maybe she is just organized and not put together. Why is that evil? Why is that a negative energy? All right, well, Lisa, we're gonna go for you. Oh, I did get someone else, but we're gonna go for Lisa who raised your hand first. And then Dina, Lisa, let's hear. So there was a child who um, working in the cubicle next to mine in school, told the speech therapist yesterday, she said, do you know what I found out? I'm smart. And this child, by the way, I want you to know in terms of context is somewhere between three and four years old, adorable. And the speech therapist asked her, how did you know? I've always known that, but how did you know? And she said, well, because last night was parent teachers and the teacher told my mommy that I'm smart. And my mommy told me, so now I know I'm smart. So she was sharing this with her and, and she was also sharing it with me in the next cubicle, wanting to make sure everybody knew she was smart. So on the one hand, we were both thrilled. And on the other, there was something about it that was still bothering me. And which I'm thinking, why is this bothering me? And then I went back and said, I was thinking about it. You know, you have an ashama. You have part of a shem in you. And she straightened up and nodded. And I said, Hashem is the smartest. So if we remember that we have Hashem inside of us, then we know how smart we are. And I feel like when we when we like bash ourselves for whatever the fill in the blank is, yeah, we can I can self-talk myself and say, wow, I'm in for a really holy Shabbos because the Yitzhar is really after me right now, Era Shabbos. But I, I really think it comes down to it's almost like denying that nefeshelakus within myself to not perceive all of the amazing potential. That's so beautiful. That's so deep. That's much deeper than what I was thinking. But at first I want to comment on what Elisa said. I love that idea because I think we all like, you want to compliment your children. You want your children to believe in themselves, but you don't want them to be egotistical, but you want them to believe in themselves, but you don't want them to be an ego trip. So how do you balance that? So I love what Elisa said, what I say with my Dober, nine-year-old Down syndrome child, and I've said this with him his whole life. He knows this line very well. Whenever he does something that I want him to feel smart, I think it's very critical to feel smart. The line we always say, and we sign it out, is thank you, Hashem, for making me smart. Thank you, Hashem, for making me smart. Smart. Okay. Thank you, Hashem, for making me smart. <laughs> Forgot how we do it. Um, yeah, and it's the same point. You want the child to feel smart, you want it, but you want it to not be a, oh, you know, we know lots of people that have been raised that way and so full of themselves, and that's not what we want. So giving them that esteem, but making it a, a God esteem, not a self-esteem. That was sort of parenthetical. But when Elisa answered the question, so to speak, why is it evil? And she gave a very deep answer, which is a very true answer is that anytime we're bashing ourselves, the evil is negating the beauty and perfection that's inside of us. You're a godly soul. You're perfect. You're amazing. God's limitless. Your soul's limitless. Access it. What do you mean you're not capable? You are beyond capable. And if not, did you, do you not know yourself? Do you not know how big God is? A beautiful answer. Dina, what were you going to say? I was going to say something a lot like more simple and not me too. Simple. Let's hear your simple <laughs> version of the story. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, like, I noticed for myself, like it, 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 over time you start to believe it and you start to believe that, oh, Shabbos is so early. There's no time. They're the same amount of time as if it starts at eight P, you know, it, it's the same amount of time, but you start to believe that I can't handle it or I can't do something or there's not enough time or the circumstances aren't right for me 
when, okay, so like you have one last side dish or you have, you know, it's, it's okay. But we start to like raise ourselves to a certain level and then fail at it and then tell ourselves we can't do it, which is not helpful. Oh, so why are you saying it's evil? I agree with everything you said, but so what's the evil in it? The evil in it is that we're like, the voice over time makes us actually believe it. So the evil is, be- well, I'm saying that's that's definitely true, but I'm saying in this specific situation, what's so evil about the person saying, I'm just organized and then and, and I'm not put together and therefore every week the same thing happens. I scream at my husband, I scream at my kids and I'm mad at my husband, I'm mad at my kids and I'm of course the most mad at myself. Why would, why would that be the point of attack, so to speak? It also takes away from Shabbos. No, I mean, like, just absolutely. it takes absolutely. away from everything you just did. Imagine if this actually happens to someone every week, imagine what their Shabbos tastes like. Imagine how they feel every week. They probably dread Shabbos, don't like Shabbos, feel bad. All their associations with Shabbos are so negative. It's bringing such negative energy into Shabbos. Of course, it's coming from an evil place. It's actually interesting. It says that the Yetz Sahara, the evil inclination, specifically targets interactions between couples on Fridays. So if you've noticed a pattern, specifically on Fridays, the Yetz Sahara, the evil inclination, is targeting the relationship between oh. a husband and a wife. You say, oh, now I get it. Now it's my time to play. I miss that for sure. But that's actually what's happening every Friday. So in our situation, this woman is the total target of an evil that she is fueling by this belief. She's creating it. So what should she tell herself? I mean, she's only been telling her this for 30 years. So she knows it's true. It's not a belief. It's reality. You don't think it's real? Come to my house on a Friday and you'll see. I am disorganized. I am not put together. I'm probably dysfunctional. My house definitely feels dysfunctional. My kids and husband would say it. So again, in advance, you need to make something that you're going to feed every time that rises in you, that tension, that stress, that I can't handle it. I'm not put together. This is out of control. I'm out of control. If everyone could think of just a simple message to say, to replace all this junk and envision that every time it comes up, that's what she replaces. Now, I think Aliza's example in this very specific case was very beautiful. And yes, it doesn't hurt for her to sit and think and plot how to do it differently. All that's very true as well. Maybe speaking to a friend and also make Chavez every week might help. But we're talking about the evil energy here. That's what we're focusing on. This just happens to be the example. So if you would like to raise your hand with a message, or if you would like to send it up on a chat, what is the message that she, we should tell ourselves, the godly message, the positive message to stop believing in the evil one, the negative one, which is truly evil. Just a simple message prepared, ready in your pocket to pull out every single time that I can't handle this, I'm out of control, I'm so disorganized, simple message. Okay, I have one hand up. I would like every single person's hand up because- My my hand's up, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, I got two <laughs> hands up. Great. On the bottom of your screen, well, I don't know, on, on the computer, it's on the bottom, it says reactions. I got a third hand. We oh. deal with this. This is oh. real life. You might have, oh, you did it. You see? So simple to learn. Uh, you might have no issues with Fridays at 4 p.m., but just- extrapolate to whatever issues you have and put it in this situation. All right, we got three hands up. We're only waiting for three more people. The pressure is on, of course. What to tell yourself to have ready in your pocket for when when that evil would come attacking your brain cells, evil created by you. Well, Yael said she she was taking something and applying it. So she got such a golden star. I, I can't, I can't I knock her for anything tonight. Uh, all right, well, let's go with it's across my screen. I don't think everyone's screen has a different order. This is across mine. Dina. So um I actually am do not have a house full of kids yet. And I go out for a lot of meals and the Yatsahara is still there Friday afternoon. So I think it's the Yatsahara being there. I don't think it has to do with how crazy your household is. 
Um, and it could be like, oh my gosh, I have nothing to wear and I'm trying on a hundred outfits right before candle lighting. And why is it not, you know, why is something not working all of a sudden right before candle lighting and stressing me out? And, um, and I try to like, remember that like the goal is connection and not like getting through a to-do list or whatever. Give me a message. And- Give me a message that you are telling yourself when you feel, why am I so dysfunctional that five minutes before candle lighting and I don't have kids and I finished work two hours ago and I'm not lighting early. The message message? that I actually tell myself is to like, to test myself that it's not about the end result. It's about the way that I get there. That's what I tell myself. And if I do it smiling and if I do it calmly and if I do it with like embracing Shabbos, then I've succeeded. And it's not about getting everything done on the to-do list. That's great. And I agree. If this is someone's issue, I just picked an example that I hope was somewhat normal range. So we wouldn't be like, why are we talking about something that never happens? But I love that. And yeah, change your to-do list. That's great. Ma'ayan, because you're next across my screen. Yeah. (laughs) So I basically like really do most of my thinking like for my kids. Like, like, how would I want my kids to remember me? Like, how, what am I going to say in order for them to take it and apply it to their life as well? So I really like try hard to like think before I whine or, um, you know, like everything is happening for a reason. Like I could, I I could do this. I could push through this. Um, whatever is going to come my way, like, we'll, we'll get through it together. You guys will help me. Like if I have to do a Shabbos, like I'll give everybody a job or if they don't want to do it. Okay. And like, I always just show them that like, it's so exciting to have guests and like, I try not to make it like, like a tircha to, to show them that like, you know, life is God. And even when we're like feeling down, like we could just push through this and just tell yourself, like, we got this, we got this. You said so many great things. She said like four messages, you know, just all (laughs) rolled into one. So you have to be listening carefully to count off four. I was, but my brain's a little fuzzy, so I can't remember (laughs) them all now. But the message was great. And what my is saying is sort of the backstory of all of her messages. And by the way, I agree with you. And I do also think like that, not always, but sometimes like what gifts, I think it was sort of like, what gifts do I want my children to have in 30 years? Like, like not tomorrow. But like in five years or in 10, depending on their age, in 20 years and 30 years, when they, like, I think this is how I think, but I think when they think back to their mother, what do I want them to remember? What do I want them to think? What do I want them to feel as the treasured gifts their mother gave them? Something else I think of, like, also along those lines in a different way is what I'm doing is creating all their patterns. How do I want my grandchildren treated? You know, <laughs> how do I want, how do I want them to interact with their spouses? Well, guess where it starts. So that is hyper amazing motivation. Now, for some of you will say that's not good motivation. You're not living for someone else. And it, and I, it, if it doesn't work, don't do it. You know, it's, if it doesn't work, it's not your story. You don't have to embrace it. But if you do think that way, because it is a real story, it is true, as we all know, because we're all the products of parents. And we all think back to what we received or didn't in our home and what was the values and what were the priorities and what were the gifts. So we actually know it's a true story that we're telling ourselves here. It's, it's, yes, I don't know if if it helps in the moment, if it's it's a moment, use it. But what I really like that Mayan said was the practical thing. She is the messages. We're going to get, I'm going to get through this. We're going to do this together. I'm going to give jobs, divide and conquer. And if they don't do their job, that's fine too. I have, I can handle this. I have the skills for this. Those are the messages that replace that evil. Yehudit. I'm here. Sorry, I couldn't click on. Um, mine was very, very simple. It was really just identical. Simple is actually the best. By the way, I'm going to stop that. Why do I say simple is the best? Because this is something you, I mean, meaning we're, we're doing this so we will then fashion for ourselves in our own situations. I don't know if anyone here has an issue with Arab Shabbos, four o'clock, and the day is getting longer, and that's not the point. So general, general concept, simple is best, because when you're in your moment of stress, you're only going to remember something very simple. Okay, Short, so simple. I, Go for I it. like to 
identify that that is the evil, you know, that is that voice in my head is the to her. That's like number one, like when I'm sitting there and I'm just like eating myself up, I'm like, okay, that's, you know, that's your to her talking. That's number one. And then I like to think about like two or three positive things that I'm thankful for in that thing. So like, let's say you give the Arab Shabbos, you know, um, example. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, my husband didn't help me enough. And then, and my kids are, blah, blah, blah. and then I'm thinking like, thank God I have a husband and thank God I have kids. And thank you know, like I just go into that mode and try to be more thankful versus upset about everything. What you're saying is a great tool. So there's two great tools that Hudit was using. One, which is similar to what Elisa said about her own personal last Friday. She's the first thing she's doing is identifying it as evil as coming from the Yitzhahara. That is a critical first step. You can say, oh, I know it's the Yitzhahara. I have, I have a lot of relationship. We, we have a long history. It's really good to remind yourself that. This isn't me. This isn't my dysfunctionality. This isn't my disorganization. This is the Yitzhahara. This is evil. I love Elisa's line. I'm not talking to you. I have got into enough trouble because of that one. We're not engaging. So that's great for step for like any situation. The second thing you did said, which is a wonderful tool, wonderful tool, is put yourself in the space of blessings and exactly in the stress, find the blessing. And my husband did it. Thank God I have a husband. Thank God I have children that are making such messes. My life would be so much different if I didn't have that. Thank God we have all this food that, that, that's sitting there on the counter waiting for me to deal with it. I'm sure my grandparents, that wasn't their problem. They, I, I literally sometimes think well, we have, it, you know, so many, so much food to make for Chavez. Imagine if the stress was, how am I going to get the food? There is no food or it's totally out of the reach of affording any food. As we know, all the stories, they were all true. So yes, that is a great tool in general. In this situation, I actually want, because we're talking here about shifting the negative belief that is creating the problem. So I'm going to go here more for, let's say, for example, what Mayan said about, I, that, 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 doesn't make it whatever, however you fill out that sentence, I have all the skills and tools needed in this situation. I have all the skills to handle this situation. I have all the skills to handle the situation. Everything in your brain is screaming, no, 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 I do not have the tools. You just, that is an evil belief. And we are uprooting it by having a positive belief that we're replacing it with. I have all the tools needed in this situation. All the tools. I am totally in control. I am an organized, efficient person. What do you mean? Other persons say they're organized and efficient when they're clearly not. Well, again, your belief creates your reality. The more you believe you're dysfunctional and disorganized, the more that's what you see, which is what we call self-fulfilling prophecies. So we want to change it at the foundational level. I am an organized person. As an organized person, what am I going to do? Oh, maybe I'll be like Elisa and make my call on Wednesday. Maybe it'll be like some other people and make it on Thursday. I don't know what I'm to do this week. Options. Maybe we'll eat matzo. I'm an organized person. I am a competent person. I have all the tools and skill sets needed for this situation. But in general, what you did said about remembering your blessings in those moments of stress is one of the strongest techniques I know. I use it all the time. I advise it all the time. I'm glad you know it too, because when you feel your blessings, what happens is your stress level shrinks. It just goes down. You feel an inner calm. Imagine A, this is evil. B, I'm lessening my stress by thinking of how blessed I am in these points of stress. And then I give myself a very affirming positive message and not letting me think the negative one. Eliza. So this may sound ridiculous, um, but the part that I didn't initially share with last week's story was when I said, I know you're the Sahara and I'm not talking to you because I learned from Chava, 
I then, my next thought, so I, I'm going to share that other next thought was, and you know what? Even if things are not exactly what they wanted them to be, I know as soon as I bench lift, everything's completed. So whether it's really completed the way that I had it in my head or not, it's completed, which means it's a hara. I can literally conquer you the minute I bench lift. You're out of here. I know, kind of crazy, but no, um, no, no. It yeah. works, it works, it works. But again, the affirming thought is underneath that, what Elisa's saying is, I'm in charge. I'm a capable, competent, in charge person. That's the message. Again, in this specific case, for this woman who feels she's disorganized and not in control, I'm in control. I'm in charge. When Aliza says to the Sahara, I'm in charge. When I bench those candles, you're gone. She's saying, I am a competent, in control, in charge person. And that's the affirmation. That's the healthy, godly belief that's going to remove the other one. You just keep saying it and acting that way. Shira, whose hand was up and then went down. Hi. Um, I think I do a little bit of all of those things, depending on the situation. There are some times I'll tell myself like, okay, see, it's a hara, especially for Shabbos. No matter how, what I do on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, something always happens last minute, right before candlelight. Always. Only in your house. Only in your house. No, I'm sure everybody, but like always something. It could be, I could do everything right. I could say the next coming week, okay, this, this went wrong. Now I'm going to do this on Tuesday. Something always comes up. Um, so in that situation, I was telling myself, like, okay, it's Sahara, you think, like, kind of like what everyone, what, 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 what everyone else is saying, you know, you think you're going to win, I'm not going to let you win, and, like, like watch me, kind of thing. Like, I, I'm going to prove to you that you are not going to win this. Um, with the kids, like, kind of what Yehudi said about, or, like, the husband, I'll be like, okay, well, thank God I have these kids. Thank God I have this husband. I just, it's, it's, I think a lot of times it's just looking at, like, the positive in the situation, it just makes it so much easier. Even like last night, I was on a flight back from Florida and the plane was literally like the whole flight. People were like screaming because they thought we were going to crash. There was, it was bumping. It was like just going back. It was really, really scary. I started saying to hell and I really thought we were all going to die. Oh, someone I, told, was there like a monsoon in Florida yesterday? I don't know what it was. I, I, yeah. The, uh, yeah, I think, I think there was, I think there was something crazy. Unless you're saying that weather happened in New Jersey, but I think in Florida, there actually was some very crazy weather. Oh, really? Oh, when we left, it was like raining, but like, no, the flight was really, really scary. I have never experienced that. And I just started thinking of like all the amazing things I have in my life. And I'm like, Hashem, if you're going to take me now, I'm going to say Shema. And I appreciate everything you've given me. I was like, my husband. And I'm like, you are the most amazing guy in the world. Everything I ever thought that maybe like, you know, you annoyed me about, like, like I'm never, I'm never going to think about that, think about that again. And you know, I think just putting into perspective makes it so much easier. Hashem said that was the reason for the whole plane suffering. So. No, I really thought so. Like, I really thought like, you were sure. the most perfect husband in the entire world. Like, it was, it was my, it was him and my baby and that was it. And I just like, let me just appreciate it. And I was also, I only slept like, I only slept two hours the night before. So I was bad exhausted, but that exhaustion didn't even bother me because I was more worried about dying. So... You know, it just depends you what you're decided what you're your last at. moments you're going to live and you did. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Put that, put that vision in your pocket. Wow. Okay. I want to do another example. So that, that was an example. And in a sense, it was an easier example in that we honestly can all understand and take ownership for those negative beliefs. We create them. We're the one thinking the thoughts. And obviously, if a person constantly feeds herself, going back to Yael, who gave us six thoughts that probably all resonated, when you keep telling yourself, I'm not put together, I can't handle this, I don't have the skills, I don't have the tools, I'm not organized, I'm dysfunctional. Well, obviously, guess what? That's what your life looks like. So that's perfectly logical. We don't have to be big believers to see that. But as we're saying, it's also true for other people in your world. Not that your thoughts create the entirety of their issue, but you have a percentage. You are impacting. And when you heal yourself and your thoughts, 
this will help the situation. And definitely what should help is that you don't have to deal with the situation. So I'm going to get another example. I'll give an example with a husband. Now, maybe the example I gave is totally not relevant to you. Like you would never be bothered by this or that's not your issue at all. I was just trying to think of something that could be in someone's world. So another example, let's say your husband doesn't learn or doesn't dive in or doesn't do either. And it really bothers you. Now, obviously you're not creating his issue, but you're a factor. So you want to work on your piece. So what is the negative message this wife is feeding herself that is feeding the issue? What is she telling herself, which is strengthening and supporting this man's not learning and or not dominating? What do you think she's telling herself? Did he not do that? He's a Jewish guy. He knows better. What's wrong with him? Like, why can't you get it together? Anyone else? Any other thoughts on what she's thinking? I don't think she's saying any of this, but what is she thinking? Remember, we said that the Lavatar ever says your negative thoughts about another person affect the other person. So what is she thinking about her husband? Tira gave us a number of thoughts. Anyone else? I think it's mainly like disrespect in a way. Huge disrespect. Huge disrespect. And then and you, you take that disrespect to... and make it a sentence. Because that is, of course, the core here is her disrespect. What is she disrespectfully thinking about her husband? He is. Finish the sentence. He can't get it together. He can't. Okay. He can't get it together. He can't get it together in what's important to me. He's a loser in what's important to me. Or any other version of that story. Yudit is right. Disrespect. Enormous disrespect. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on what she's telling herself about him, which is feeding his issue? Eliza? I guess I'm thinking of almost the, the opposite in a sense. Um, that when, okay, I, I think more along the lines of children, but um, that we want to catch them in the act of doing what we want. And so if there's something in my husband that I, I really want to bring out more, it's not, this is a finished product, or I, I wouldn't want to be seen as a finished product, but it's, I, I want to praise whatever I see in that area. I'm not asking you how to change it yet. First, I'm asking, what is her erroneous, wrong, Yetzirah, fallacious beliefs? So what is she saying that's the wrong message to herself, which is feeding the problem? That he's less than. He's less than, exactly. He's less than, finish off the sentence. He's less than my dreams. He's less than my expectations. He's less than, I literally had a call from a woman. Thank God has about six children, <laughs> married a number of years, has a very wonderful, successful, religious husband and, and was literally saying she feels so bad about him because he's not what she wanted. She wanted more. I'm like, what's he lacking? I'm trying to figure out what the problem is. He's not deep enough. He's not smart enough. Yes, he learns and he learns very well, but he doesn't really get the depth. You want to fuel the negativity? You go right down that road. My vision, my reality, he's less than. And it doesn't make a difference if you never had a vision or reality about davening or learning. It's just an example. He's not good enough. That's the negative beliefs. And that's that's a that's an evil. It's a I was an evil inclination. See, it's a her, it's an evil. And in this case, it's very obvious the goal of this evil. Why are we saying there's an evil Yetzahara at work pushing her to think my husband is such a loser? My husband is less than what I wanted. My husband is not worthy of being respected. He doesn't learn, he doesn't dissolve it. How can you respect such a person? Why would the, the Yitzhahara, why would the evil nation want a person to think such thoughts in this specific situation? What's the gain the Yitzhahara has from it? Why are we calling it an evil? There's a gain the Yitzhahara has here. Achokas. For sure. The Yitzhahara is, you're so holy. Yeah, your husband doesn't learn and that bothers you. Your husband doesn't dive and that bothers you. Your, your mama should say, take us. You're like, you're like, Rachel H. S. Rabbi Akiva. She also wanted her husband to learn. You're, you're walking holy roads. 
create tremendous conflict, permit tremendous dissatisfaction in the marriage. And also your negative thoughts feed and fuel his lack of dominating, his lack of learning. So as you think these thoughts, he is more not dominating and more not learning. So the answer is women. Lack of shallow bias, lack of dominating, lack of learning. It was like a three for one deal here. That's why this is evil. That's why these thoughts are evil. So what would be a godly positive message to remove belief in the evil one? What would be a godly positive message to remove belief in the evil one? Again, we want to focus on the message. I'm feeding myself a message. My husband is a loser. My husband's not what I dreamed and hoped for. My husband's not worthy of my respect. My husband's less than every other man on the block. So what, but, but he's not learning or dominating and learning and dominating is very important to you. So what's the positive message you create to think every time you again confront the fact that he's not learning or dominating? What could you tell yourself? Well, a lot of the times where, I mean, like we spoke about before, like it's just telling yourself the positive things and the good things about your husband and really like believing it and truly like, but what Being can I like, tell myself? Because I'll, I, he takes out the garbage five times a day, but I want him to learn. I want him to dominate. So the fact right. that he takes out my garbage and makes a good living and is generous with me and is a nice father, those are all true. But this is what I care about. So what can I tell myself? I just, again, I'm not saying this is anyone's issue. I just want right. to make it so that we get tools. We get used to thinking how to change that message for the message that's appropriate in this situation. So in this well, situation, just what his you journey. Tell that that's his journey with Hashem. Like it's not your, it's not your choice to make for him. Like that, like you really have to believe that that's his journey with Hashem. And like as much as you want that for him or for yourself, like it's, it's unchanging. There's there's nothing you could change about it. You could definitely like drop hints and and say things nicely and like oh I love it when you, when Actually, you when it really it. makes me happy and it, it makes me feel so so happy to see you go to that sheer oh is it so nice can you tell me about it like just dropping little seeds rather than like oh my god why are you not at mincha like you're so like why are you sitting on the couch like just different words just change your words perfect how do, how do we have all these great <laughs> we we know this so well so yes i love what my young said that's a great thought my husband is on his own journey this is not my journey that's his journey and I'm trusting him on, on his journey. I'm trusting him on his journey. Every time it comes into your head, loser, not what I wanted, less than, can't respect. My husband's on his journey. I trust him on his journey. Mrs. That's Turin, what if something, what if something a man should be doing is going to be affecting you and your family? This is affecting you and your family. If he doesn't learn and doesn't dominate, it's tremendously affecting you and your family. Right. So that's, so how can you, because you're, because as you said correctly, the upsetness about it, the message, my husband's the loser is not solving anything. It's actually feeding his lack of learning and dominating. So my young here, she, I didn't even ask for it. That was her, just her, her bonus uh, gift to us. She gave some suggestions what to do. She wasn't saying, well, he's not learning and dominating, but I'm cool with that. Of course, none of us are cool with that. And as you're saying, he doesn't learn, he doesn't dominate. That affects me. That affects my life. That affects our life. Hello. But again, when we when we feed into the negative feelings about him and the negative vision of him, it doesn't help. It doesn't solve. It's just like when the person's screaming, because I have to whatever with my kids, that's not helping. When a person could tell themselves a positive message, like husband's a good person and he's growing. Is he where I want him to be? No. In this situation, again, I'm giving a very extreme example here. Is he where he should be? No. No. Are we can hurt by this. Yes. But all of that doesn't change the reality that the person thinking, my husband's a loser, I can't respect such a person, my husband's not what I dreamt, this is not what I signed up for, he's not what I want, it doesn't do any good, it's just 
as you said, feeding the machlekes, the lack of harmony in the house, and it's feeding his not learning and not dominating. So we need to be a very wise wife. You know, our sages say that women were given an extra measure of understanding. God doesn't waste things. He gave us an extra measure of understanding because we need it. We need that extra understanding with our husband and with our children. Not only with our children, also sometimes with our husband. So with that extra understanding, it's not like you say, oh, cool, he doesn't learn, he doesn't dumb. It's great. He's an awesome husband. But you don't say, I married a loser. You say, he's a good person. You steal Mayan's line. She's not copywriting it. He's on his journey. He's going to succeed on his journey. God is with him on his journey. He's a good person. He's growing. You tell yourself that. And then when you're in this very positive state of vision of him, since he's going on his journey and he's growing and he's good, what can I do to help the journey? And then you think, like Mayan said, catch him when he's good. Compliment, share, be interested, even though you have 50 million things going on in your brain, but he actually learned something, show appreciation. Say, I, I'm so touched you did that. I know it's helping you and us. It was your gift to us. I so appreciate that gift. And that's it. Walk away. Even better, say it an hour after it happened to show that you were really remembering it and thinking about it. Or any other such situation. But as a Bina Yaseira, as a woman with understanding, just like with our children, wouldn't it be easy if we just told them what to do? This one, stop whining. This one, go to bed on time. This one, do your homework. This one, wake up in the morning. We say it, they do it. Beautiful. Not in anyone's world that I know of. So it's the same thing with our husbands. Why don't you go to Minion? Why are you sitting on the couch? Do you not know what time it is? Do you not care? Do you not want to dive it? Do you not care about your Yiddish kind? Do you not care about your relationship with God? Do you not care about us? Now, one of those sentences is going to create anything good. No, no, it got him out of the house. All right, I don't know if he walked to show. I don't know if he, did, I don't know if he opened up a cinder. He might have gone in the back and complained to his friends about his horrible wife. So you have to think with your extra understanding, how do I get him to want to dive in? How do I get him to appreciate learning? And what you could do for your husband, just like for your children, is take on something extra, asking God to help him. Just as if you had a child that refused to daven or refused to learn. What's going to be with this kid? He refuses to daven. I can't get him to daven. His teacher can't get him to daven. His principal can't get him to daven. What am I supposed to do? Maybe turn to God. Maybe take on an extra resolution. Maybe say, I'm going to improve my davening. And it's a gift that this child will open up the sitter and want to talk to you. You can do the same thing for your husband. So you could both strategically figure out ways to get him to think on his own. He's deciding to daven with a minion in Joel or even just to daven at home. If that's what we're holding, that's amazing. And you can also give gifts to Hashem. Hashem, I'm doing this extra. Put it in his account. Help open up his heart to davening. Help heal. Whatever is going on in his heart that he doesn't want to dive and help heal whatever is going on in his heart that he doesn't want to talk to you, that he doesn't want to learn. So you definitely want him to do those things, but your negative vision of him is not helping the situation, just like your negative vision of your child. If your child, again, was doing something wrong and you keep thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to be with this kid? Oh my gosh, this kid is the most difficult child I've ever dealt with. Not one of those thoughts help your child. It actually, every one of those thoughts reinforce the problems your child is currently struggling with. So when you look at your child and you think every time, instead of thinking, oh my gosh, who's going to marry someone like this? Or who's going to be, a, you know, you think, wow, my child is so strong. She's going to turn over worlds for good. Every turning, single time. Are you talking time. about me? What? Are you talking about me? <laughs> Not specifically, but no, but if it no, applies, but you grab you it. No, you told me that a couple of years ago. And I'm like, okay. oh my God, this kid is nuts. She's so strong. What am I going to do with her? She's impossible. And you're like, you're, it's not going to work. You're just feeding it. You're feeding it. And sure enough, I was at a point where like, I'm like, I don't care anymore. I just kept feeding it. 
And then after I couldn't feed anymore because it was just too out of control, I'm like, I'm just done. And then I started thinking of all the positive traits and how you can, you know, be stubborn for good things and strong personality for good things. And thank God I'm seeing like the Naha starting like my three months ago. Wow. So it does. But Shira, because you're saying that, and because this is a class, and I don't believe you're the only one that has a strong willed child. I think it's sort of like a Jewish trait. Um, how <laughs> long did it take from when you started thinking positively until you saw even a little bit of change? Not that your case is everyone else's case. I'm just 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 asking if you can sort oh, of um, it was a while because it took me a long time to really 100 percent you know convince myself that these traits are awesome that when she acts this way, it's okay. And she's so beautiful. And it took me a while, but like it, I did it slowly. And that maybe for sure, like a year when I really like finally said, okay, no, it's all positive, all good. Cause the other way didn't work. So I was kind of stuck and this therapist didn't work and that therapist didn't work. So I was really stuck. And that's when I kind of like turned to shine. Like he gave me this kid, helped me think positive about her and helped me just, you know, see all the great qualities and, you know, that, you know, and, that she's channeling it properly and she will. And I'm telling you just recently, like within the past a couple of months, I started seeing, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm thank you for this. Nahas. It's about time. She's so old already. Oh, so okay. there is hope guys. There I is hope guys. So Shira work. said it took about a year. <laughs> I, I'm, I know, I'm just putting work. that out. Not, it that's again, what, Yael? I said, I, I agree. It does work. It does work. Oh, my aunt said she agrees it works. And, and Mayan, if you've done that, how long do you, re- do you remember? Sometimes it's hard to like pinpoint, but do you remember like roughly how long you saw? So not, I'm not yeah, saying I mean, the person def- became definitely, completely turned around. Yeah. It definitely took longer than like a couple, like three months, but definitely. Yeah. I think, a I think a good, like nine, nine months. And then like I did, I did all the Tehillim and the, you know, for kid with Sadaka and just like just positive, 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 positive. And and also myself talking positively to that child and giving that child positive messages and just knowing that like, I believe in you. I, we got this, like, you know, just showing them whenever they, they said something bad happened in their day. Like I always pointed out the positive and like, you know, it's just seeds, you just drop the seeds and it, it does, it does work. You just got to keep going. Like you can't give up after a month because it's not going to take a month. Okay. But it does work. Okay. So we have two personal testimonies here and it just as it works with your children it works with your husband it works with your children it works with your husband we do feed into the negative and we feed into the positive when you have a very strong-willed child who's driving you and everyone else crazy are you the source of all their problems well maybe because you're their mother but probably they're also a contributing factor but as a mother, your positive thoughts, and as my aunt saying, and your positive speech and your positive interactions with, I mean, you can keep going and going and going with it. But I'm starting with your positive thoughts have an enormous impact on this child's life and vision of self. Well, why? I'm just thinking it. So you could say, well, she reads your body language, which she does. She reads your tension, which she does. She reads your dis- unhappiness when you walk around her house, which she does but it's also a spiritual energy. And that's what we're talking about here. It's and a spiritual also, energy. And they also know it. You don't have to say anything besides for like feeling it. They know exactly what you're thinking. You're a pain in the butt. You cause me so much trouble. Why don't you listen? They know, I don't never have to say a word. And they're like, like she'll say it. She's say it out loud to me. And I'm like, in my head, like, yep, 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 yep. You're right. Um, that's exactly so what I'm really thinking. <laughs> it, and, and, that's, and that's true. And that's why, obviously, could you imagine if every time you walked her in, you felt your mother thinking, I, you know, it's like the kid, like the teacher's joke that there's a, that child that has perfect attendance. So his child, you're like, why don't they ever not show up one day? Come on, a break, one day. So imagine if you were a child and every time you walked in the house, you had your mother, you felt your mother get tense, stiffen up, force a not real smile. How does that reinforce a child's vision of self? But it's also deeper because it really is a spiritual force that we have. When Lubavitcher is saying, when you think negatively about someone, it strengthens their evil, he doesn't only mean if they're right in front of you and they're picking up your thoughts. He doesn't only mean if it's your child. 
We truly impact other people by our thoughts. But of course, as a mother, we impact even more. And as a wife, we impact even more. And the impact goes in both directions. For the negative, we're all very familiar with that road. And for the positive. And with our children and with our husbands, and we might have success stories, but we're not as freely going to talk about them as we're going to talk about our stubborn children. It works the same. Our positive vision, my husband's an accomplished doer. My husband's working on himself. My husband's growing. My husband is so much better today than he was whenever. My husband's journey. I, I love that line. My husband's May I journey. Really quick, may I interrupt really sure. quickly? Speaking of it going in both directions, because at this point I need to take Hala. And so what I want to do is before I it's Wednesday, I'm she's already thinking about Thomas. <laughs> no, because I, well, I'm on my journey and I am journeying. So if, if I may, I want to make the bracha and then I'll be excusing myself. But this way, everyone can say amen and be on that journey with me with the positivity going in that direction. Okay. Sure. Go for it. Uh, I'm used to looking. Excuse me, Brach Shenka Vemachasali Alamba. Babrach Hatadrunai Lehina Melachalam, Asher Kedushani Vemachasa Vitivana Le Precious Hala, Min Ha Isa, Hare Zu Hala. Amen. 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 And all the enormous brachas of Afreshas Hala, of separating the Hala, should come into you, into your husband, into your lives. Amen. And I'm going to make mine on Friday. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be delicious. I'm going to go see the healer at sun and excuse myself. Thank you, Elisa. Have, have a good week. Good Shabbos. So I also have quickly, I wasn't, I was thinking in my head if I should share it or not, but um, I have a child who's in Israel right now. It's his year. And um, also like he was a very, very hard in high school. I would fight with him to dive in, not even to learn, just to dive in. Let's just get that part through. And he just he wasn't taking and so now he's in Israel and I was subbing at his high school recently and a teacher his old teacher came up to me and said I want you to know your son has texted me every Shabbos since he's been in Israel to say have a good Shabbos and he's and he's talked to me about what Gemara he should be learning and just I was just like are you serious like I had no idea thank you so much for telling me and I'm like so like something's working like in his own quiet way he's doing it and I didn't know did you do anything, Miriam, to help that journey? Did you take on a mitzvah or stuck or tehillim or positive thoughts? Or Hashem's just kindly dealing with it, even without your, your intervention? Um, I do the regulars. I wasn't taking on anything. No, I wasn't. I was just, you know, in my head, just talking to Hashem, like, okay, if it's not meant to be that he does this, what am I going to do? Like, it is what it is. And then... And then this teacher, and I and I called my son right away to tell him, I want you to know I got the best Nathlet report about you. I know you're 18, and, like, that sounds funny to hear, but it's true. And he was so happy to hear. Like, he was just, yeah, so. I think what I found sometimes with children, not with every child, and when I say children, that doesn't mean they're 5 or 10 or 12 or 15. They could also be in their 30s or, you know, and beyond. But some children don't want to tell us when they're direct doing for sure they just and it's like almost like this weird relationship they have they love us they know what we want but it's almost like i don't even think i'm giving into you i don't even think i'm doing this because you want me to do this so when they're doing exactly what we've been davening for and giving stuck up for and saying to him for and taking on all these great resolutions for we might be the last to know now listen we're just glad they're doing it but it, it does happen sometimes. Sometimes, of course, kids are like the first to tell us and they want us to know. And sometimes kids like, because it's almost like that. I'm doing it, but I don't want you to think it had anything to do with you. I don't want you to think that at all. So I'm not even telling you about it. And that's okay, because thank God he's doing it. And when you told him, instead of him being like, oh, ma, why did he tell you? He was happy. So that's beautiful. No, in fact, he even called the teacher to tell him my mom just told me this. And I was like... That's so like, okay, we're good. We're good. And it's a wonderful thing too for all of your children and your husband and yourself to say the tell them every day and just draw down the kindness, draw down the compassion to give stucca every day for each child. Stucca is very powerful. A nickel doesn't have any more than that. 
just every day to draw down God's blessings. And as we're saying here, so taking Miriam's example, now it's easier for her, but it's the journey's not over. As my aunt said, we're journeying. So to really think, look at him. He's so wonderful. He doesn't even want me to know the good he's doing. Just imagining the good he's doing. Just so grateful for the good, I, the person he's becoming, the man I know he's going to be. Because those thoughts, and again, it doesn't make a difference that he, he's oceans away from us. Your thoughts affect him. Your thoughts really do. And they're really helping supporting him on this journey. So that's really beautiful. We should all have that nachas. And we should, in our own life, because we gave very specific examples that might not have been relevant to you, whoever the you is at all. But in our own lives, to really stop and think this point, because it's a very deep point, and every one of us lives with this point. What are the negative, truly evil beliefs that I feed myself and that play out in my vision of self and therefore in my life and that play out in the lives of people that are close to me? What's my negative vision? What do I do with my husband? What do I do with my children? But of other people in my world. And that negative vision is playing out in our relationship. And if you can't think in terms of other people, if that's too much responsibility and you don't want to go there, start by thinking of yourself. What are the messages I feed myself that are self-destructive, that are harming, that are not true? No, they're very true. No, they're not true. All the truth you see is only because of those messages. Think of the lines you say to yourself. What Yael said before, very popular line, I can't handle this. Have something in your pocket. Anytime you're going to say, I can't handle this, replace it with, I am so capable. I am so competent. I've gone through X number of childbirths. I can't handle this one. I can handle this. And I know God only gives you what you can handle. I'm fine. Whatever line works. And I'm just giving one simple example. Stop and really take the time to think. What are the evil beliefs I feed myself about myself? What are the evil beliefs I feed myself about others? And how am I going to change that? What message am I going to create that every time my brain goes tripping down that road, I say, nope. Like many of us said, that's evil inclination. That's Yitzhara. I'm not talking to you. And this is what I say instead. Shira Mayan said, about nine months, about a year for a specific issue with a child. It might take less. It might take more. But this works. And you're worth it. Your husband's worth it. Your children are worth it. The joy in your home is worth it. The peace in your home is worth it. Your relationships with other people is worth it. You could be feeding yourself negative beliefs about your mother and about your mother-in-law and about your... It's worth it. Thank you so much for joining. Next week in honor of Hanukkah, we are not having class. So I thought we would touch on Hanukkah now, but clearly not meant to be. But Hanukkah is a time of miracles and wonders. And this idea of self-transformation, transforming our negative visions that become realities in our own lives and in others' lives, all the positive, miraculous energy of Hanukkah should help speed up those journeys. Shouldn't be a 12 month process. It shouldn't be a nine month process. What we're doing should have the wings of the miracles of Hanukkah, and we should see it like Miriam saw it without Amen. even knowing it was happening. It was good Shabbos. And thank, thank you so much you. for joining. Thank you so much.